Hi, my name is Katie Chartrand. I'm a senior researcher at James Cook University here in Cairns, Australia. I'm actually out here today on the Great Barrier Reef uh, and I'm coming to you to answer some of your great questions through the citizens of the Great Barrier Reef about coral restoration. Um, now before I get to some of those questions, uh, we happen to be out here involved with some coral uh, restoration projects that are just getting started. So I wanted to take the opportunity and first sort of introduce you to what I see uh, the value and what the role of what coral restoration can play. Uh, and first off, I think the word restoration uh, is somewhat confusing because in itself it implies we're restoring the reefs back to something that they once were. I think the reality is that we can play a role in aiding these reefs and intervening to ensure there's coral um, out there to recover through its own natural processes. But we cannot um, in, by any means uh, to develop the same habitat complexity and biodiversity that the natural system creates. So we're here to give it a sort of helping hand through these times. Uh, and I think the other really important thing uh, to recognize is that by no means do these approaches um, take away from the need and the immediate uh, need to deal with climate change and path emissions and tackle those issues. Um, we are developing um, sort of the science behind these restoration approaches to ensure we have coral into the future during these periods that we know we're already going to see global declines on coral reefs. So other scientists and researchers around the world are working in this space and we're all trying to work together for that same aim. And there's lots of different techniques and lots of great science that's being done to investigate what the best approach is to move forward. So I'm gonna get back to your questions once I get back to shore, but I just wanted to say hello because we happen to be out here. We're very lucky to be able to still be working uh, on the Great Barrier Reef today with Reef Magic, one of the operators that's been incredibly supportive around some of these restoration techniques. So thanks very much and I'll talk to you soon. Hi everyone, I'm back from the reef. So I wanted to go ahead and address some of the questions that have come through um, that you guys have um, posted. So thanks very much for those. Um, I'll start with the first one from Danielle. So Danielle has asked, uh, well, she wants to know more about bleaching resistant coral reefs and what they look like. Are there certain species that are more resilient? Um, I think the idea of a bleaching resistant coral reef, um, what it looks like doesn't really exist or look very different from a normal reef. Um, we do know that there are certain species that, that have a tendency to um, be able to bounce back from a bleaching event. So rather than um, sort of dying back after um, being stressed from that warm water, um, losing that photosymbiont, that zooxanthellae, as many of you would know the name by, um, from their tissues, which is very stressful given they're their main food supply to most corals out there on the reef. Um, that, that many, if they lose that food supply for a certain length of time due to that warm water persisting over the reef, um, that many will die off and the tissue will eventually necrose and you will get algae sort of growing over that leftover white coral skeleton, which is what you're seeing um, through that transparent tissues when it's bleached. Um, so some corals though, um, we think have a capacity and we're not really understanding this fully yet, um, but have some capacity to withstand those warmer waters. Um, there's some branching um, corals, Acropora tenuis has been identified as a potential candidate as being somewhat more resistant. Um, we see some of those large boulder corals like the parietes that tend to um, bounce back, uh, although some very much do die um, and have died back after these large bleaching events. Um, soft corals as well, while they'll bleach, they tend to also be able to reacquire that algae. Um, although again, all of these different varieties do um, die off if that warm water persists long enough. Um, what more to the point is, is uh, the, that host animal, the coral, um, and where it's growing, we see there's populations that maybe have acclimated or adapted to some spikes in warm water. Um, we see that corals that are, um, some studies showing corals growing up in sort of shallow water mangrove environments doing incredibly well because they've, you know, become used to and adapted to that really hot water spikes during a low tide event. Um, so the same species, which occurs on the outer reef in those very stable temperature conditions, um, found growing actually inshore in the mangroves can do incredibly well. So there is a lot of research going into how these corals inshore are sort of tolerant to these extreme events and how we can harness that 
um, to, to rear up some of these in these coral nurseries that are being used for restoration. So there's some great work looking into this. And the other side of the, the story, though, is also that symbionts. So we know that some symbionts appear to be um, more resistant to those warm water events. So it's really that relationship between the coral animal and that photosymbiont or that zooxanthellae, and that both of those appear to matter. Um, so if we have a certain sort of species of symbiont in those tissues, we found that those corals seem to do better during a warming event. So it's a very complex relationship um, that, that isn't super easy to, to um, explain in a short, short video like this, but just to point out that it, it's not something you can necessarily see with the naked eye to say that this coral reef here is a resistant um, reef to bleaching. Um, we've seen that bleaching can happen on inshore, offshore, mid-shelf reefs um, that's happened over the last number of years, including this year. Um, so nowhere is really safe um, given the state of climate change and warming that we're seeing here. Um, in particular on the Great Barrier Reef and globally. So all reefs, no matter how far removed from um, high population centers, are still at risk um, due to climate change. Okay, the next question comes from Kate. Hi, Kate. It's often said that coral restoration is not worth the investment as the scales that can be achieved are too small. What are your thoughts on this? Hmm. I think that's a really valid point that many people have. And I think that coral restoration can be at many scales. And I think most importantly, we have to look at what the objective is. Um, some approaches, um, which involve say fragmenting or taking pieces of coral that have broken off a colony, like this one I have here. This is a dead skeleton, so there's no obviously live tissue. It's not bleached, it's actually just the skeleton itself. Um, so a coral like this um, will often break out, break off pieces from wind and wave action. Um, and at times uh, there'll be divers that will go out and attach these fragments back onto the reef or back onto what we call a, some sort of frame, a coral nursery, where they're able to grow up into a larger size before they're then placed back down somewhere on the reef structure. Now that sort of approach um, has its value. I think that um, to think that it doesn't um, is is limited if if you're thinking about large scale restoration in terms of when we talk about having an impact on the entirety of the Great Barrier Reef, which we know is huge. The size of Italy is often it's compared to. Um, so that kind of approach isn't necessarily um, going to have a serious impact. But it can have great value for, say, a tourism operator, um, someone that's wanting to look after sort of their local patch. Um, and there's value in that, both in terms of the ecology of that local system, and there's also value in it uh, for the, the economy. Um, if we can keep those patches of reef healthy, that really supports um, here in Cairns our tourism sector that really relies on visitors from around the world to experience the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so we want to reach out and, of course, put money and investment into some of the approaches that can help somewhat rapidly to increase coral cover. Um, obviously, trying to enhance the biodiversity, the species diversity that we're putting out there, and um, conscious of making sure that we have various genetic individuals. Um, we know that a colony like this is uh, just one real individual. It's all the exact same thing. So if a fragment breaks off, this isn't a completely new genetic individual. Um, it just means that um, they're clones of each other. So we just need to be conscious about some of these approaches and how we um, sort of are putting these things back on the reef that makes sense uh, in terms of the biology and ensuring that any potential stress or disturbance um, would not impact all of it the same and you necessarily wipe out um, your, your reef and all of the efforts that you've done because you basically are handling a single clone. So all those sort of things get built into the designs and, and the science, which we're monitoring and, and developing. Um, so we're out there really trying to understand what impacts we're having and not only looking at the successes, but also learning from those failures. So these approaches are really valuable at small scale and also for ways to potentially grow up individuals that will then go on to spawn. So releasing those egg and sperm bundles. So it has other values than just maybe say that individual colony. It can then have a spillover effect and you're creating thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals from that single colony during those mass spawning events. So it really depends on your objective. We talk about some of the other techniques like mass spawning events where we harness 
those egg and sperm bundles and rear up millions of larvae. Uh, now that is aimed at much larger scales and that has been a stepwise approach that's been building each year um, from various research groups that are working in this space. And there's been some great successes in the Philippines um, over the last couple of years here on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, we had the most larvae that have ever been reared out um, in the wild in a floating um, sort of nursery system, over 150 million larvae that we were able to, um, to measure through our efforts this last year. Um, we're yet to, of course, as I said, see what the, the impacts of that is and, and the results are over time. Um, but each year is sort of a stepwise improvement in the engineering, the logistics, the biology. So it's really all of those elements that have to come together and all of the people and partnerships that come together to make those happen. So I guess getting back to, um, you know, is it worth the investment? Um, I think it, it most definitely is. We know that if we do nothing at this point that um, things are changing and we will lose our reefs. So if we don't do something now um, to ensure sure that we that we have something and we have the techniques in place um, into the future I, I think we're, we're really missing out so I think now is the time to develop the science and make sure we have the tools and invest smartly I think that's the key okay the next question is from missing on Australia um, she says what are the results you have seen from your work um, I would assume that's referring to the larval seeding program that I've been uh, involved with the last two years um, this was a partnership, um, our project, just to give a little bit of a background first. Um, the project was a partnership between Professor Peter Harrison, myself, and Associate Professor David Suggett, uh, as well as our really important tourism partners. And those are Aruna Boat Charters and Reef Magic. Um, so those were the tourism partners based here in Cairns that really came together to support uh, the science and deliver a very large scale um, program and trial uh, to see how we could capture those millions of egg and sperm bundles during that annual mass spawning event. Um, so this was back in November this last year and we did it the year prior as well here off Cairns. Um, now, the very first year um, was definitely a trial for us, um, the first time to really do this at such large scales. There had been some efforts down around Heron Island, um, and of course, there's been work by Professor Peter Harrison and his team over in the Philippines that have had a great track record of getting um, some really good successes and uh, coral recruitment um, back into the systems on heavily degraded reefs, especially over in the Philippines. So we knew that we were coming in with some great um, science that had been established, but to really get to scale and to work here off cans on a reef that was further offshore without the kind of infrastructure that you have of a lab nearby was, was a real trial. Um, this last year was uh, incredibly rewarding in that we were able to rear over 150 million larvae through our efforts um, using these large inflatable spawn catchers and larval rearing pools that we had out at um, near, near Reef Magic's pontoon out there at Moore Reef, so that's just off of Cairns. Uh, and out there, we were able to um, put those larvae back down on the reef using a number of different uh, sort of techniques. So we're really still trialing the best way to sort of deliver those larvae after they've fully developed, which takes around one week after that big spawning event occurs. Um, so we had this uh, gravity-fed sort of diver seeding approach where it was very low budget way to basically use the gravity and a tube to basically squirt these um, new coral larvae down onto the reef at that sort of slack tide. So you didn't have that strong current sort of pushing those larvae away from the reef. Um, so we've trialed that method. We've also used sort of underwater sheeting, which has been done before by the team. Um, and by both techniques, which was really exciting, we were able to see um, in the days following that we could measure significant recruitment and settlement so that attachment of those new larvae. And those very first attached larvae um, metamorphose or change into that first coral polyp, which is known as a coral spat. Um, so we measured those on these small square recruitment tiles. And I actually have one here, I'm just realizing I can show you. Um, excuse my interruption. Um, so this guy right here is what I'm referring to when we talk about these recruitment tiles. Um, so they're just a small terracotta tile that's secured on sort of a metal rod that's temporarily installed on the reef. 
Um, we leave it out there ahead of time so it can recruit that sort of natural film and biota that you would expect on the reef. So then those the little larvae, as they're swimming around, actively hunting for somewhere to, to secure themselves, um, recognize that as the normal reef substrate. Um, but that allows us to then take those tiles back to the surface and hunt for those little microscopic um, little spats using our microscopes on board um, the pontoon and on Aruna, our, our sort of floating research vessel for the work. Um, so we were able to actually detect a strong recruitment or attachment of the larvae that we put down on the reef compared to other reefs that we would then put similar tiles down on and look for natural recruitment in from that natural, you know, sort of settlement process um, following the spawning event. So we could see a significant effect from our efforts, which was really exciting. Of course, time will be the real um, sort of teller of, of how successful we are. And at this point, Due to COVID-19, we haven't been able to get out there again with our microscopes and do the full-scale checks. Um, about four months or so in, or five months now we are since um, that big spawning event. Um, we may have to wait a little while longer yet, um, so hopefully we'll have um, some ideas on the outcomes then. Uh, and really at 12 months though, that's gonna be the real telling point. So besides just looking at these small tiles, we'll be able to see how many of those little spat actually survived, um, sort of that natural um, die off, which does occur. So many of those little new juvenile corals will die off. We know that occurs, that's mother nature's natural process. It's a competitive world out there on the reef. Um, but we need to see if our extra efforts actually will boost coral beyond what we would expect if we just left it to its own devices. So we'll be measuring that around the 12 month mark. Um, and that will be when you can start to see these little juvenile corals with your naked eye. Um, so we'll be out there then checking. So the next question is from Barbara and she says, can you recommend a good reference book on corals? Barbara, yes, I have one that is probably a very user-friendly option that I happen to have here with me in the office. It's called the Coral Finder. Um, it's by Russell Kelly. Um, there's a few different versions of it. Um, this is a really handy one because it's actually um, printed on this sort of water resistant paper. So you can actually have it out with you if you're going out to the reef, uh, wanna have it on board the boat, uh, somewhere that can get splashed with water, probably not best to take it underwater with you. Um, but it's a really handy guide um, because it really breaks down corals into their growth form. So if you're looking for one, I recommend looking that up. Um, it talks about branching corals versus massive corals, um, sort of brain corals. So check it out. It's really good. It goes from sort of these larger pictures of the overall colony um, to sort of a close-up uh, close of the individual sort of branches. This is a branching coral and a acropora coral um, down to what that coral-like structure looks like. So it's a really handy tool um, to, to have an understanding about the, some of the more common species. I mean, this book isn't going to give you the full breakdown of everything, but it's a great place to start. For those that are really keen, um, and I know there's some of you probably out there, um, I don't have the official cover on it because it's one of the old copies that I've had for a number of years, but The Corals of Australia in the Indo-Pacific. So this is Charlie Varon's book. I highly recommend. This is considered um, sort of the Bible for, for those of the working in this space. Um, there is an online version, so have a look um, if you're looking for corals of um, Australia and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, freely available if you want to reference any anything there, but it goes into all of the species, um, quite a few acroporas, um, and hopefully you can become a bit of an expert on, on the various forms that you're seeing out there while enjoying the reef. Okay, Lauren asked one more little question about whether there are any particularly resilient and fast growing soft corals. Um, so off cans and really uh, across the Great Barrier Reef, um, we see soft corals from the genus Sarcophyton, Lobophyton, Cinularia, um, Nepthias. They're all very common um, soft corals that you'll see. Um, for those interested, you can look up some of those. Um, now these soft corals, um, tend to be somewhat slow growing. Um, they very much can be impacted by um, warming events. So these mass bleaching events that occur here on the reef um, because soft corals can, they harbor um, often a photosymbiont or zezantheli as well. Um, so you do see these soft corals bleaching. And in fact, when I was out uh, yesterday, uh, some of the back reef lagoon was still, you could see the soft corals while they hadn't died back, they were still missing a lot of that uh, zozantheli or photosymbiont from their tissues. So they're still in that recovery phase, despite the fact that um, those waters have well and truly started to cool 
cool down. So it takes a bit of time. Um, so those soft corals can bleach, but they also tend to be a little bit more resilient than their um, sort of hard coral counterparts. Not to say that they don't die off during these mass bleaching events, they very well can. Um, but by and large, you tend to see the soft corals um, sort of rebounding in time. And um, while stressed, they often eventually can sort of take over, we've seen. And, and that is in formal studies that we've been a part of here, but we're noticing that those soft corals are very much taking over um, open substrate that was created by some of that hard coral community dying off. So those soft corals can sort of asexually um, sort of fragment and break off and create smaller sort of clones of themselves to take over that area. And they also sexually reproduce um, through mass spawning events as well. Um, but multiple ways in which that can occur. Um, so they can tend to be somewhat more resilient. Um, not that fast growing, I, I would say. I mean, that's a very general comment. Um, there's all kinds of conditions that really drive um, the rate of growth um, within a species and within the community. So higher water flow in general can, can really affect um, that a faster growth rate compared to slower water flow, depending on what part of the reef they're growing. So it's, it's a bit complex to say, but by and large, somewhat slower growing. Okay, next one is from Lauren. Hi, Lauren. And you've asked, what part of the reef are you currently doing this research on? Um, so for the larval restoration project that we've been doing the last couple of years, uh, that has been here off Cairns at a reef, um, which is called Moore Reef. And that's where one of our tourism partners, uh, Reef Magic, is uh, mainly based for their operations. Um, so it was a great sort of starting point. And also there's a really healthy patch of, of coral there that we were able to focus our efforts for, for capturing that spawn to ensure we got sort of those numbers that we needed, while also not impacting sort of that natural process of um, spawning and larval development to, to kind of give back to the system um, naturally. So we didn't want to obviously be focusing on a reef that was already degraded, um, putting um, those sort of egg and sperm bundles back into the system. Um, some of the other restoration projects I'm involved with are some of those smaller sort of fragmentation and coral nursery programs um, that have sort of a, a slightly different objectives in supporting our local reefs and our operators. Um, now some of those projects are also, again, um, local, which is around Fitzroy Island, Island, um, out at Hastings Reef, um, and we also do other, you know, monitoring programs for, for coral in that area um, related to some of the ports programs and ensuring that um, sort of those corals that are in those inshore um, port habitats are, are staying quite healthy, um, and that gets down even to some of the Sunday region uh, of the coast. Okay, the last question is from Global Evergreening Alliance, uh, who asks, what do you wish more people knew about reef restoration? Um, I'd say first off that it's relatively young here, especially in Australia, um, on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we've only really actively been looking at restoration or this intervention approach um, to aiding the reef uh, for the last few years. Um, before that, I think um, the idea was that very hands-off, um, and that came from a policy level, um, a researcher level, um, the community level. There wasn't the need or concern at that point to really intervene in the processes that are going on on the reef. And I think the 2016 and 17 mass bleaching event really pointed out um, that nowhere is going to be untouched when we're faced uh, with climate change, which is a reality that we're already dealing with. It's already happening. Um, we're seeing large uh, die-off events um, that we saw back in those years in the far northern section. Um, this last year, um, more in the central and southern section. So nowhere is going to be untouched from this. And the reality is that the reefs are going to decline. I think that's already been shown and um, accepted by the scientific community. I think the question now is, is can we ensure that there's corals left um, to have a reef in the future if we can in fact cap our emissions and as I think I mentioned yesterday when I was out on the reef I think at the core of this that that we're not trying to um, distract from climate change through these reef restoration efforts and I maybe go on about that but because I think it's also so important I think the science is what's needed um, to tell us about what we should be doing moving forward within this reef restoration space and I think that has to be the driving factor together with the partnerships so up until now I think and I say now is in the last um, few years here on the reef that 
researchers and scientists have sort of worked in their own space and you know tourism operators have been out showing people uh, the beauty of the reef and there's been somewhat limited um, interactions and I think more and more um, we're recognizing the benefits of coming together in really close-knit partnerships, very meaningful partnerships that really benefit each other in not just one way, not just giving researchers and scientists a lift out to the reef um, to be able to do their work, but also trying to give back and help those tourism operators to ensure that they have healthy reef systems and how they can really act as stewards of the reef. So it becomes this really cross-industry partnerships, and that goes beyond just tourism operators and researchers or scientists and that becomes with the general community um, getting behind some of these approaches it goes to the wider um, reef industry community so that can be the engineers um, the ideas to come up with all kinds of solutions that um, the science community doesn't necessarily have to ensure we can work and, and intervene and aid coral out on the reef in these very remote conditions so it really takes a team a team effort to come together and you know that's really the approach that um, you know the government is getting behind um, the reef restora restoration and adaptation program um, is all about so run by and are driven by um, sort of this partnership of institutions here in Queensland um, and working on sort of ideas of intervention and restoration and how we can work together in this space and and I think that's only going to build so I think we all are after that outcome is to have healthy reefs into the future. Um, and while even us in the science community, we can differ in how we think we should get there, I think um, as sort of that foundation and that core principle is that the science is going to drive what approach we take and what is a smart use of the funds and objectives um, to achieve that goal, um, both for the biology, the ecology, but also for the economy that we have to support um, through these different restoration efforts. So. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I appreciate for all of those that stuck through all of my, my answers and commentary. So I hope this sort of um, leads to further discussion. And if you ever want to reach out, by all means, um, please contact me by my email here at James Cook University. Um, and hope everyone is staying safe and well um, in current circumstances. Thank you.